Today's webinar is entitled Caregiver, Caregiver Resources. Your presenter is Kelly Hamm. Kelly is the Consumer Health Coordinator for the National Libraries of Medicine, Pacific Southwest Region. Kelly helps libraries and community organizations provide quality health information services to the public. Kelly develops presentations and training materials with a focus on health literacy, new technologies for delivery of health information, and services to special populations. I'm now happy to introduce Kelly Hamm. Hi, everyone, and thank you for coming to today's webinar. Uh, so our objectives for today will be to try to fully understand the whole spectrum of caregiving topics. It's a very ambitious uh, area. There are many, many topics. Um, so we'll be looking specifically at some of the daily tasks that caregivers face and the challenges facing uh, people who are in those caregiver situations. We will look at some of the specific resources for conditions such as Alzheimer's disease uh, and, and ways that you can find resources um, for other special uh, situations. We'll be looking at resources about financial issues, uh, how to find a nursing home, other kinds of legal and ethical questions. And also, the, one of the most important things is caring for the, the health and well-being of the caregiver themselves. Okay, so just for a brief overview, now people are living longer and longer, and what that means is that in, in their older uh, age, there are mo many more chronic conditions and health issues. So for caregivers of people who are older, usually there are a number of health issues that the, the person is dealing with. Adults often find themselves in caregiver roles that they're not really prepared for. It could be caregiving for a, an elderly parent or for a spouse, maybe someone who's been injured in, you know, in uh, the military or, you know, who knows. It could be a variety of things. The other thing is that, um, as I mentioned, most people are not trained or prepared for this role. Uh, if you think of the, the training that a nurse would have to go through to be a caregiver, um, you know, most people are not prepared for that. And providing care for a loved one or someone that you're close to can take just a tremendous toll in terms of all kinds of, of health issues, whether it's mental health, physical health, but also things like um, finances because caregivers often pay out of their pocket for, for certain kinds of care and supplies and resources. So these slides, the next few slides have a lot of text on them. I'm just going to bring out some of the highlights so that you'll uh, have, have a sense. I'm not going to read everything to you. But basically, you know, we have many people, one in three, uh, at any given time caring for someone who is either chronically ill or disabled um, during any given year. And the, the statistics show they spend an average of 20 hours a week. Now, this is on top of other things that they're doing, you know, work, caring for their, their other family members and kids and so forth. Nearly three quarters of caregivers report that they don't take care of themselves as well as they should. They don't go to the doctor as often. They skip their own appointments. They also don't eat as well. They uh, quit exercising or don't exercise as much as they once did uh, during this caregiving time frame. Another uh, thing is that it really it can affect the work that the caregiver does. So in the workplace, uh, some statistics show that uh, two-thirds have gone home, um, I'm sorry, two-thirds have gone in late, left early, or taken time off at some point during the day. And uh, other, uh, another statistic is that a lot of times they have to take a leave of absence just because the caregiving needs are so great. 47% uh, of caregivers indicate that they have used up much of their savings. It, it can be a real financial drain on people. And so at this point, I'd like to ask any of you, I, I'm sure there are people on the call who have either experienced a caregiving uh, situation themselves or they know someone who has. And so I'd like to get some feedback from everyone as we you know, start this. What is something that comes to mind? I'd like to have you type into the chat box 
either a word or a phrase that comes to mind when you think about caregiving. And feel free to submit more than one entry. I would just like to see what people have to say, and then we'll, we'll discuss a little bit about some of the common themes. So um, I have been a caregiver myself, a long-distance caregiver, when my, my dad was ill about a year and a half ago, and that was such an eye-opening experience uh, in so many ways. And so I have some ideas here, too. I'm just looking at some of the things that are coming in. We have um, guilt. It's exhausting. Very tiring and emotionally draining. Uh, lots of stress and worry. Feelings of being overwhelmed. Uh, this one is was true for me, too. Life-changing. Emotionally rewarding yet exhausting. Yeah, and heartbreaking. Problems finding balance, yes. So that's a, a an example of something where, you know, where we think about our work life um, balance, but then what about our, our, uh, you know, the obligations we have? Thank you for for all of these. I know that as we go through this, you'll think of other things too. It's a real good way of just looking at the whole spectrum and gamut of of the emotions that we feel. Lonely, mm -hmm. drains you mentally, limited resources. I wanted to say before I go on, uh, my sister lived in the town where where my father was, and I lived over a thousand miles away. And so uh, we had a unique situation where where he did have a caregiver who was there on a regular basis, and each of us experienced the the whole thing in a different way. And, and luckily, we had each other for for our support. And we'll talk a little bit more as we go on about some of the ways that, that um, people can find support. In your role as librarians and library staff, you'll be answering questions of, you know, when people come into the library. But all of the information that we have here in this webinar will also apply to you at some point in the future, most likely. Or you'll be able to provide help for, um, for friends who are going through the same thing. So. All right, so thank you for all of that. Um, the range of emotions is normal. As, as uh, someone is going through this experience, if they're feeling guilty, it's completely normal. It makes, uh, you know, makes for a more interesting experience. But, but what, what people also find, and this came through in the, um, the comments that were just posted, is that there are positive feelings too. So some of the, the feelings can be guilt and anger, sadness, um, the, the helplessness, the motion, emotionally drained feeling. But also, it often is an opportunity to spend time with a person. It's not always quality time, but it can be because uh, in, in some cases there hasn't been that time, you know, the one-on-one -on -one conversations and so forth. So, so it's not entirely bad. There are some very serious things that can happen with a caregiver, especially if it's in a long-term situation. It can create enormous stress because of the time and all of the, the worry and uh, all of the things that are involved. It is often the case where people show symptoms of clinical depression after a time. Physical injuries are common, too, when, when there's a, a a lifting situation where someone has to be helped in and out of bed or in and out of chairs or wheelchairs. So proper lifting techniques are very important. Um, it's also been shown that people have lowered immune systems and even after the caregiving situation ends, the immune system takes a while to catch up. Many people have sleep disorders, have trouble sleeping, and also don't sleep as much as they should and the health issues just from the, the neglect that the caregiver, you know, does to themselves. So when the caregiver comes into the library, um, you will know that just if they're asking health questions in general, the user can be really upset or worried, angry, uh, but the caregiver is facing these issues plus 
more. So sometimes they can even be facing more emotions than someone with a with a health question that is, you know, on, on a different level. So it's always helpful to just think about the reference interview, try to get as much information as possible about the individual situation, and you'll know more when we go through the different parts of this uh, talk to know what kinds of questions to ask because you'll already know what resources are available. So then you can offer the resources that are specific to their situation and let them know that there are many other resources because throughout their caregiving experience, they'll go through stages. And at one point in time, they'll need some types of information, but later they'll need other types of information. So it's always good to let them know that there are other resources that will help them as they go down that path. So the good news is, is that you know we we are not able to help fix the, all the problems, but having access to information is really key. It goes a, a long way towards helping them through these difficult tasks. So what I'm about to present will be um, falls into a couple of different areas. Uh, there are the legal and ethical issues, and how people can start having that conversation. Because even if a person isn't a caregiver right now, they may become a caregiver and they may see it coming, you know, given a situation. They may know that within a few years or at some point in time, they will become that person's caregiver. So it's important to get started talking about it. And I have some resources that can help um, get those talks going. And then finally, we'll, we'll talk about um, caring for the caregiver. So here is, the, here is a resource. Now, I do want to mention there will be a handout. Uh, and if it's not up on the web now, it will be. I just sent it right before the webinar started. So uh, check after the webinar is done. There's a, a resource handout that has extensive resources. And everything you see on the slides will be on that handout. So you don't have to write these down as we go along, but I'll just explain a little bit about each one as we as we go through the slides. So this one is really about the things to that will help you start that conversation. Sometimes, especially if it's an elderly parent, there may be some resistance to talk about finances or you know, any kind of advanced planning, but there are some strategies, and this is a nice document. There are many others, but this one was a good one that kind of lays out a few strategies to get started talking about these issues. And, you know, in the best case scenario is when someone is already thinking about it, when they already have their will in place, they've, they've thought about what kind of health care decisions they want, you know, when the time comes that they can't speak for themselves. So if all of that is in place already, it's just good to know about it and to have copies of it. So these, these are the kinds of things that will help any caregiver. Here are a couple of resources. And um, the Family Caregiver Alliance is, a, is a, an organization that has excellent information about caregiving. And for our purposes with the legal issues, there are some sections that describe advanced directives and living wills. And also, I found one resource here that was on um, the LGBT caregiving situations, because that's, that's a unique type of a situation where, in many states, there, uh, the rights of a, of a partner might not be recognized. And so these are, are issues that should be considered and um, knowing about this resource would be a, a good place um, to go for that kind of information. The AGS Foundation for Health and Aging, and I have to apologize, I forgot to write down what AGS stands for, and I will, um, I think it's the Association or the American Geriatric Society, but I will find out if I can and let you know before the webinar is done. Um, but anyway, this, this site is Health in Aging, and that's how I know it. And it's uh, a really good um, site that talks about the, you know, the decisions that someone needs to make if they are unable to speak for themselves. It has 
very good descriptions of all of the issues. So I recommend this particular resource just for people who, who need an easy to understand look at all of the terms, like what does it mean to have uh, your, uh, your personal representative and um, what is a, a DNR, a do not resuscitate order and those kinds of things. There is another site called Caring Connections, and this is actually from the, um, just a second, I can tell you. It's um, an organization that is, I have to go back to another page. Uh, it's a program of the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. And what's nice about this particular uh, site is that it has links to every state form for advanced directives. Each state has kind of their own um, accepted forms. And so this has information about advanced directives, but also forms that you can, you can go to. So in talking about advanced directives and some of the decisions that need to be made, uh, there, there is a book I'd like to point out, and it deals with end-of-life issues. And this is an excellent book from the National Institutes on Aging. It's available for free, or you can download the PDF online. So just so you know that these, these kinds of resources are available from NIH, uh, the National Institutes of Health, and the different institutes. But this is a wonderful book. It's um, a soft cover book, but you could order a copy for your library or even order several copies to give away if you wanted to do something like that or to have a special program. Um, it's, a, it's an excellent resource. Now, moving to another section, um, the, the caregiver is going to be in a situation where they need to find um, services and local organizations. So, and not only services, but what kind, how, are, how are they going to pay for these services? Because um, nursing home care is very expensive, assisted living arrangements, any kind of services where you bring someone into the home to help with meals or, or other kinds of services, it's all very expensive. So there, there may be resources available locally, and uh, how, how would you possibly go about finding them? Well, if the library, uh, the library should have some, uh, a collection of information about the community resources, any local organizations, the senior centers, all of those kinds of things. So we're just assuming that, that that's already in place. And if not, it might be a good idea to, to have somebody, you know, kind of take that on as a project and keep information at the reference desk about the local resources. And, uh, and those, those organizations change all the time. So it's the kind of thing that is a, you know, an ongoing um, project to keep up with what's happening. But anyway, here are a couple of resources, eldercare.gov. That, and when you go to this page, it brings up, uh, it's, it's really a directory of all kinds of resources. It can be for um, finding, um, you know, housekeeping services even. So the Elder Care Locator, it, it is also an excellent resource for the Area Agency on Aging uh, organizations within the counties. And that, so this is the place where you can find those those AAA organizations, and they are a wealth of information. We'll talk a little bit more about them later on. Benefitscheckup.org is a, another website that will ask a few questions of the person when, to find out what kind of resources they are eligible for. And when I say resources, I mean benefits, such as if, if there was a, I'm just going to use a, an example. Let's say there was an elderly person in uh, you know Northern California, and they uh, had very low income. The site will ask you know what is your age, what is your sex, are there any? I, I think it asks if there are any disabilities, and then it gives some examples like if the person is blind or or other kinds of disabilities, 
and then what the income is and the uh, if they're receiving any benefits right now. So it asks a few questions like that. It doesn't ask for any personally identifying information, but then it will return the results as to what the person might be eligible for, including maybe food stamps or you know some sort of uh, commodity program, food programs in the community, and it's all based on location. So. This is a really good resource for anyone who's wondering what benefits they may be eligible for. Benefitscheckup.org. And then if you haven't been to the Medicare.gov website, it's I mean they're Medicare and Medicaid. Both of them have, you know, different kinds of information. But Medicare.gov is interesting because there, there's a lot there that's not really obvious at first glance. One of the sections they have, which is actually kind of hard to find, you have to know where to look uh, for caregivers. And it's all about the, the things you need to know about Medicare when you're taking care of somebody who's on Medicare. And I recommend that you watch the four minute video because it explains all of the different parts of the, the caregiver site within the Medicare.gov site. So it's, it's worth looking at. Another thing that many people aren't aware of, if, if a person is wanting to know about um, choosing a nursing home, that's a big, big task. And it's very stressful when you have to go through that uh, for a number of reasons. But the Medicare.gov website has a number of resources that can help you. One of them is there is a way that you can look at the, they're not, rankings of the of the nursing homes but what they are is the nursing homes have to undergo um, site visits and during these site visits they're given kind of an assessment as to how well they're doing in a number of different areas and so you can look at the reports for the actual nursing homes and it tells you how how recent the report was and so when when my sister and I were looking for a nursing home for my father we were able to look at the reports for all of the nursing homes in the little town where he lives. And it was very telling. And by printing out the, the report, I was able to have good conversations with the people who ran the nursing homes to say, well, you know, I see that this was an area of concern on the report. How have you addressed this? Or are there efforts underway to correct this? And, and it was a really interesting to see how they responded to that. So um, just wanted to let everyone know that this is the place that you can go to find. And also, not every nursing home accepts Medicare. And so in some cases, there won't be a report. But if they do, uh, if they are able to accept Medicare payments, then they will have the, the reports. Medicaid is, is another program. But just be aware that each state has their own Medicaid um, programs. And so if you go to Medicaid.gov, it will give you basic information. And then you need to actually drill down to the state that you're interested in. Now, insurance is a tricky thing for many, for, for all kinds of caregiving situations. and so. In California, it's called, and I don't know how to pronounce this acronym, but HICAP, possibly. So it's, there's a federal program, and in different states, it's sometimes called something else. It could be the state health insurance program, SHIP, as an example. But in California, it's called HICAP, and there are organizations all throughout the state that will help people understand what their Medicare um, benefits are, what other kinds of insurance uh, coverages are, and any concerns you have. This is an excellent resource, and I encourage you to look at the ones in your particular area so that you have this as a resource for your library users. And I also have included a link, in case you're not from California, um, how to find out that we're, where to get information in, in, in another state. And it's also important, you know, many caregivers who come in the library are going to be in a situation like I was where the person they're caring for is in another state. So knowing, and that's another reason why I've, I've provided some information about other state resources, 
because it may be that even though the caregiver is in California, they may be caring for someone somewhere else. So now moving on a little bit to what what is it that caregivers do on a daily basis? Um, we've talked about some of the other kinds of things they do, the you know, thinking about legal arrangements and um, signing documents that tell what to do, but what about those day-to-day -day activities and how can they learn what they need to know? So what I have up on the screen now is just really starting with from the very most basic, getting into the more, what we'll call more intimate types of tasks. And um, when I say intimate, it's just that in some cases, um, you know, if you if you are paying someone's bills for them, that's very different than um, helping them bathe. And so there's a difference in the level of care and just the, the trust that goes into those kinds of activities. So we have things like grocery shopping and housekeeping, um, driving to appointments. Those can be done by by a lot of different kinds of caregivers. But then uh, when you get into brushing teeth and you know, helping someone um, use the bathroom and those kinds of things, and those, those become a little bit trickier. And even in a case where there might be a daughter and a father situation or a son and a mother, some of those activities might, there might be some discomfort in depending on the relationship. So in some cases, it's, you know, where, where the caregiver is looking for outside help to come in to take care of some of these. So I have a couple of resources here. One is hands-on skills for caregivers. And this top link is really about how to take care of, um, what, you know, like safe lifting in and out of a chair, as an example. So the physical kinds of needs that a person might have. And then the next one is a very well illustrated uh, guide for helping somebody brush and floss. It's a dental care guide. And uh, what it doesn't cover is if a person has dentures, and that's, that's another kind of a topic, but, um, but this does show the proper technique and you know helping someone who might be developmentally disabled and so forth. A few more. Now, I haven't listed everything because it would be impossible for one thing, but I just picked a few of the representative resources so you can see the kinds of things that are available. The lifting techniques for home caregivers is, is also very well illustrated um, that shows how to, you know, move someone in and out of bed into a wheelchair and the same thing with the resource right below it, the rehabilitation tip sheets. This one has actual photos and it was intended for re for rehabilitation centers and for health professionals, but then it was it's also been modified so that it can be useful for people in a home care situation. And the last one, activities of daily living, tips for the family caregiver. I, I put this one in because ADL is actually a term that's used to uh, assess what the needs are of the patient. So for instance, if, if someone is reaching the point where they are having trouble walking to the bathroom or they're having trouble preparing their own meals or you know they can't drive anymore or there are a whole variety of things and so there's this term the ADL uh, which is just how well the the person does all of these different things and um, so on this page it actually describes all all of those and then there's a section that has tips for the caregiver so it's a, it's a good one to know now we'll move on a little bit to some of the special situations that caregivers find themselves in. And there are dozens or more of these kinds of situations, but here are a few examples. It could be for a particular type of disease or condition, such as you know caring for the cancer patient. And uh, there are many others, like I said. There are the, the person who's needing the care. It could be a special needs child or someone with a disability, an injured vet as an example. 
And then we've talked a little bit about long distance caregiving. So these are special types of situations and there are resources for all of these kinds of situations. So before I show you some uh, specific resources, I'd like to mention a few things. The most important thing is if there is a, a health condition, then the caregiver really needs to know as much as they can about that condition, you know, what the treatments are, what the, the options are, and what maybe some of the, you know, the medications, the interactions to watch for, uh, whatever their, the person that they're caring for is facing, they need to know about caring for that condition so that they can give the best and most appropriate care. And I'd like to point out um, MedlinePlus.gov is a, is a really great resource for this kind of thing because if someone is diagnosed with heart failure but they also have uh, kidney disease at the same time, then the medications that they're taking might counteract each other. And then there are problems with things like weight gain versus uh, you know, bleeding and all, all kinds of things. So these are just a few examples. So this is where it's really important to become part of the healthcare team. You know, as the caregiver, if you can have conversations with the, the patient's doctor or nurse, healthcare provider, then you'll be in a better position to know what to watch for and to be able to um, manage health issues before they become, you know, uh, like an acute problem. Utilize the social workers at the hospital. Often they are really knowledgeable, or even the nursing staff. They are going to be, you know, kind of your front line for where the um, the resources are for particular things. So if if the caregiver you're working with at the library tells you that that the the person they're caring for has heart failure, then you can mention to them that the nurse at the at their clinic or at the hospital may be able to point them to, to uh, other support services that are specific to heart failure. And even in some cases, there are specialized trainings for particular conditions. And I wanted to mention where I live in Ventura County, every once in a while, I think maybe it comes out once every quarter, I get something from uh, the Camarillo Healthcare District, and it's a, a book that has a listing of all the classes they're teaching. And I just happened to pick it up and look, and they have an entire section called Wellness and Caregiver. I'm sure that many other counties and other health districts have these kinds of, I'm sure you've all seen them and have received them in the mail. But I was astounded to see how many classes and sessions they had on caregiving. So. As an example, um, here's one, brain injury survivor and family support groups. And then it goes on to talk about, you know, for caregivers of people with brain injuries. Uh, another one was called Nurturing the Caregiver. And that is an ongoing thing that happens um, once a month. Another one is Health Insurance Counseling and Advocacy Program, that HICAP program. So this is uh, twice a month, I'm sorry, four times a month. And then there's also a session on advanced healthcare directives, elder legal services. It was just, it goes on and on, and there, there are even more. But I just want to mention those are the kinds of things, and most of these are free. Some of them there might be a small charge for. But it's an example of the community resources. So in your library, if you can get your hands on these kinds of publications, then you would be able to uh, provide that information to, to library users. Here's another example of a free publication. This one comes from the National Institute on Aging, and it is an excellent resource. It's specific to Alzheimer's disease, but in looking at this handbook, there is a section that would apply, many of the things would apply in many different um, situations. It's 136 pages, and it's a very nicely bound book, but uh, it, it talks about things like, you know, if, if the, the person that you're caring for or the caregiver is caring for is able to, to go out, 
you know, things you need to think about when you take somebody out and depending on their condition and so forth. But as, as ways to keep them as active as possible, there are tips for helping somebody get dressed. There are tips for, you know, what you need to do for bathing or taking showers and just the, you know, helping to prevent dry skin and, and those kinds of things. It's, it's an excellent book, and so I recommend um, ordering one of these for your library just so you, you can have uh, a look at the kinds of things that are important, and in particular for Alzheimer's, but it would work for many other situations also. Again, it's a free handbook, or you can uh, download the PDF as well. Another one that I'm just pointing out as an example comes from the Muscular Dystrophy Association. It's um, the ALS uh, Caregiver's Guide, and this is very similar to the Alzheimer's Guide. Many of the tips in here would work for other situations also. Now this one is uh, for, for a family that is caring for an ALS patient, it's free, or you can download the sections as PDFs. If you, if you don't fit those categories, then you can order it for $15 at this website. So it still is pretty low cost, even if there is a, if you do have to pay for it. Uh, this is a book that I've personally used. It's called So Far Away, and it's about long distance caregiving. It's not quite as long. It's only 44 pages, but it has a wonderful section in the back for other resources, and um, just one of those kinds of things. It's a pretty easy read, but it helped put my some of my concerns to rest and help me understand what to do in a long distance caring uh, situation. So I recommend all of these as resources that you could, could order or at least be aware of. So now we're moving into the, the section about taking care of the caregiver. For any of you who have been caregivers or know somebody who has been, the you know, uh, caregivers are a certain type of person. They're the ones who step up and really kind of take charge. They're also the type of people who don't usually ask for help themselves. They they just take the bull by the horns and, and do whatever is necessary. And sometimes that comes at a cost. Um, but anyway, there are lots of of different types of support. And some of them that we'll talk a little bit about are you know, we've already been talking about the print and online resources, but there are also online support groups. Um, the social workers and mental health workers at the hospitals. Respite care is very important. Being able to take a break from the caregiving duties, and that's very, very hard for people, but it's so important. And uh, as I mentioned, there are some, you know, those those resources that you can find for your local um, the local resources, there are some that offer respite. So you'll want to check to see what is available in your own community. Uh, the directories of services, of course, and then the, the personal network of each person, you know, their family and friends. Uh, hopefully they will be able to take advantage of help that's offered by the personal networks and support groups. So I do want to point out MedlinePlus.gov has wonderful resources, and over and over again, as I was looking for something particular for this uh, webinar, I would think, oh yes, I need to go back to Medline Plus, and I would instantly find what I was looking for. The librarians at Medline Plus have done an excellent job of collecting kind of the best of the best for all of these topics. And so on the handout, I've created a number of health topic pages that directly relate to caregiving topics. And so I highly encourage you to utilize that site whenever you have a, a caregiving topic. I'm going to, to show in a little bit, um, or just on the next few slides, some examples of what is on this page, the caregiver health topic page. So I see that there's um, in the chat box about the Long Beach Police Department, that's a wonderful thing to be thinking about. I hadn't thought of that, but 
I'm sure that it's not just in Long Beach. There are probably programs like this all over. I just attended a health fair in Simi Valley, and the the people who were at the booth next to me were from the oh the the Masons or one of the the groups like that, and they have a a child um, fingerprinting program that they do for free. So any of the people who had children with them at the health fair could get their child fingerprinted with a photo taken, and then that information was just given to the parent so that if there was ever you know, a missing child situation, then they would have that identification. So that's just a free service that was offered. I'm sure there are others all over. So as promised, this was, if, if I were just to look down that caregiver topic page on Medline Plus, I know you, you might have a hard time reading this, but I'm just going to pick out a few. Under the coping section, we have respite care, taking care of you, self-care for family caregivers. Uh, there are others, you know, caring for adults with cognitive and memory impairments, caring for someone with AIDS at home, families with special needs, and caregivers in cancer. Um, scrolling down even more, and I'm only showing you the tiniest number of these, but we have things like emergency readiness for older adults and caregivers. And that that was something that I always was concerned about. One time there was a fire, a big forest fire near where my dad lived. And if something were to, to happen, I was thinking we didn't really have a plan in place because he lived in a rural area. And so what would happen if um, there were a fire and he wasn't able to drive or even really be aware of what was happening. So these are the kinds of things, the resources that are available within this Medline Plus page on caregiving. So some of the basics for caring for the caregiver, this is kind of written in, um, you know, as if it's directed towards you, the participants here, but it would also be, so it's for us, but it's also for our, our library users. Um, becoming educated about the disease or the condition, becoming part of the healthcare team, it's very important. Um, there may be a need to consult with other experts. You know, it's one thing to pull up an advanced directive, but it may be necessary to actually consult with someone uh, who, who can help with the financial and legal um, documents. A couple of other things, you know, even though it's never funny, these kinds of things, it's important to maintain your sense of humor. If there's any way to do that or to find, um, you know, something that's lighthearted in the situation and to just remember to, to laugh with the loved one, it's very important. And setting realistic goals, that's another thing. It's impossible to do everything. And so being realistic about the kinds of things that you can do, especially in a long distance caregiving uh, situation, they're just physically aren't, you're not able to be there. So uh, in my situation, I was able to take care of the financial things and handle the bank accounts and so forth, but I couldn't do the day-to-day -day things. So there are ways that you can uh, still help, but maybe not in the way that, that you would if you were right there physically. And then it's also a really good time to kind of reflect on your spiritual values and and that of the, the person that's being cared for. So a couple more things. Um, this wasn't, I didn't find this in these particular resources that I recommended, but from personal experience, I've learned that if you have, if you are organized and maintain a good filing system, it goes such a long way to help with the stress level because over and over again, I had to find a document. I had to pull something up. I had to, you know, be talking on the phone to someone. Oh, I have that right here. So that was, that was kind of tricky. Uh, I ended up making copies of a lot of things because the original files were a thousand miles away. And so I had uh, scanned documents and I had physical copies of things and tried to keep them very well organized and that helped tremendously. Another thing that I discovered is that the person who is the caregiver has to have a power of attorney if they want to do anything on behalf of the patient or the loved one. So even calling up the phone company, I wasn't able to 
even find out anything about the bill, if the bill had been paid or uh, you know what, what the status, what, what the charges were on the phone until I had the power of attorney. Now, uh, in my situation, my father was very good as he was, um, you know, as he was going through this process. We would call some of these accounts, and he would talk to them on the phone and say, "My daughter is, um, you know, going to be helping me. I'd like her name on the account." And if that was done in advance, then there was no problem. In some cases, you still have to have a legal document, like with banks and so forth. But for the phone company, if you if you just call them and they talk to the the person who is the the account holder, then that will work. But just a kind of a, a word of advice: if any of that can be taken care of before the the person is not able to speak for themselves, it is a tremendous help. And so, just a little word of advice. And Stanley makes a good point. Making PDFs of important documents really helps. Because if you have an electronic version of the important things, then you can very quickly print them out and um, have them available or send them by email. In some cases, I was able to send information by email, which works very well for me. And uh, you know, so that's a, that's a great point. Thank you, Stanley, for mentioning that. So, one other thing that is so important is to make time for all the other people in your life. Uh, when, when there is a caregiving situation, sometimes that consumes all of your time. And so it's very important to just take the time for yourself and to spend time with the other people in your life that you care about, including the dog or the cat. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's important for the caregiver and for the person who's being cared for. They don't want you to spend all of your available time with them. So they will encourage you to go do other things as well. So some of the resources, this, this one from the American Heart Association is very good, but what I really liked is that there was a set of journal pages. Journaling is a great way to kind of help you through some of the difficult times. And so they have some really nicely formatted journal pages that kind of um, get you started and, and provide some, some areas for reflection and so forth. So the link to the journal page section is on the handout, but it's also right if you click on the link that's listed here, then um, you can get it's right on the same page. So, okay, I have a couple of people who have put some things in the chat box. So, um, power of attorney is very helpful in most places. I was told by Social Security Administration that they wouldn't even talk to me with a POA. Now, when I um, I was able to do something on the website with Social Security, and it what it meant was I had to go in and I had to know certain things. Um, I had to know all of my dad's information, his social security number, and other kinds of things. And with his help, I was able to go in and get in on the account as someone that could um, work, you know, work on his behalf. So there is a way to do it, but you know, I I don't know when you if you just call them up, you know, how that works. So. And then there is another one. Yeah, the, the question about supporting the brother, um, it, it sounds very similar to my, the situation that I was in. And it's definitely, uh, you know, just send your brother some flowers. <laughs> no, I don't know if he would like that or not. But basically, just talk to him and let him know that, that you listened to this webinar and that that you're there to help whenever you can. Go visit him and you know just just be available to him, and um, and let him know that you're there if if he has any information needs too. Very good uh, suggestions in there. Keeping digital copies on a flash drive, and uh, the password data is that keeping track of all that stuff. It's so important and making sure that you don't lose the files. <laughs> okay, so we have just a few more slides left. Um, finding support groups. It's, this is another area. Some people 
need them. Some people get by without. But the one thing that is true is that there are a lot of support groups available of different kinds. Usually the hospital social worker can point you in the right direction. The Area Agency on Aging, and you can find those numbers again by going to eldercare.gov. The online resources for specific conditions. For instance, if you go to um, cancer.gov as an example, I search for support or caregiver, and often there will be an online discussion group or listings of local chapters where they have support groups. So it's not true in every case, but usually you can find information for caregivers on any of the major uh, organization websites. So here I have some specific information on the Area Agency on Aging, and before I did the, the research for this webinar, I thought there was one in every county, but it turns out that California is divided into 33 planning and service areas called PSAs, and so the link I've provided will take you to the information about these different PSAs, and you'll be able to find the local uh, resource for your county or your area. Um, really, really good resources for anything related to seniors and aging, but also um, for resources, for local resources. The California Caregiver Resource Centers, this is another area. Uh, the 11 nonprofit centers, they can give you advice, tell you where you can find the respite services, those kinds of things. And there are 11 of them throughout the state. So the one in my county is located in Santa Barbara called the Coast um, Resource Center, I think. Anyway, and the National Family Caregiver Support Program, is it's funded nationally, but also provides information, you know, at the local level, you know, for some of these kinds of services. Now, in your library situation, if you had an opportunity or a desire to build any kind of a small collection, either around caregiver resources or around services for seniors or even a small health collection, there are a number of things you can do to do it cheaply. And I've given you several examples of publications from the National Institutes of Health. There are so many uh, of the different institutes that provide excellent resources. You know, cancer.gov, the, um, the two examples that I've given here, the National Diabetes Information Clearinghouse. They have easy to read booklets, lots of really good stuff. And then the National Cancer Institute has some some books too, and including a series about different types of cancer. So these booklets are, you know, there is one on melanoma and one on breast cancer, one on prostate cancer. I, I don't remember how many, but maybe 20, 25. And I think about 10 to 15 of them are available in Spanish. Also, the, the Alzheimer's Association has done a wonderful job of well, a couple of things. There are librarians there. There's an entire section on, uh, you know, the, the library, they call it. But it's a section that's put together by librarians with really good resources for Alzheimer's information. And much of it is pulled from the, um, from the NIH resources. But it's a good place to look, uh, you know, the compilation of all that information in one place. And also they have created this wonderful toolkit called Building and Running a Small Resource Center. It was originally published for Alzheimer Association chapters and groups, but it was so useful they decided to publish it out for anybody who could use it. So I recommend you, you take a look at this if you're interested in building a small collection for your library. There are also a couple of DVDs that, now I have not looked at these, I, I can't really vouch for them, but if you were looking for something that you could um, purchase for your library, these are, oh, I want to say, for, for the, the homework DVDs and the four regular DVDs, I think it's under $50 or $60 for the whole set. I might be wrong about that, but anyway, it's called the Savvy Caregiver as a set of four DVDs. So. Just one last, a couple last tips. Um, remember to use Medline Plus if you're looking for 
the you know information on caregiving for a particular disease or condition or for that medical topic. So that's that's um, just something I want to you know remind everybody about. I see there are a couple of questions in the chat box, and I'll finish up this one last slide, and then we'll look in the chat. So I want everyone to be thinking about, in their own library situation, the earliest statistic that we looked at was that about 30% of people at any given time are caregiving for a family member or a loved one. And so chances are, in your library, there are people who are in a caregiving situation. So what the libraries can do is just identify what helps in your own institution. Let, let your staff know if there are flexible spending accounts they can use to help pay for dependent care, uh, what the policies are on family leave, and if there are community resources that might help. Now, the, there are some really interesting statistics about Work, the workplace and who are the caregivers, and so I've included a link for that here, which which might be interesting for administrators. So that's the end of my presentation, and uh, let's see, I want to go back and look at the chat box and see. Okay, so. Sounds like it looks like some people had some problems with the sound. So in creating caregiver resources for a country and or a county and a state, would you list for profit organizations separately? And you know, personally I, I probably would, but only because in my situation, you know, I have to be really cognizant of, you know, what's what's freely available and what's not. But typically, I mean if you were if you were doing um you know, if you were creating just a list of resources, you could just separate it out as, you know, the the nursing homes, the assisted living facilities. It could be, I think it would be fine either way because people clearly will know that those are for profits. Um, if you have a an kind of an annotation about you, you could describe that. Uh, I think it would be maybe an administrative question as to how it's handled. I don't know if I've been able to help, but just some of the things to think about would be, um, you know, what what your particular situation is in your institution. And, you know, I didn't see the the suggestion about working with the VA, so I'm not sure how far back that is. Oh, any suggestions on working with the VA? I, the VA should be a wonderful resource. I would just call them, and I haven't actually done that um, because I. I don't have any vets in my family that that I've had to you know find information for. My brother actually uses the um, my healthy vet website a lot, and I know it works very well for him, but I haven't actually seen how it works, so I don't know. I know that they are making great strides in trying to provide good health information and so forth. so i I wouldn't be surprised if they have some caregiver resources also. Um, I can say that there is going to be another webinar in April on resources for vets. And so if you can wait that long, there will be some information about it in April. Otherwise, send me an email separately if I didn't answer your question um, completely, and we can talk about it offline. So uh, there will be uh, the PowerPoint slides are going to be available on the Info People website. And Stanley has posted the information about the next webinar. Oh yeah, I'm. There probably is a, an, a mistake in that URL. It looks like statistics needs to have an I. If you can just try that. All right. I think we maybe have answered all of the questions. If I have missed any, feel free to send me an email. I'm going to put up the slide that has my email address on it. And I really appreciate your attendance. Uh, feel free to contact me if there's anything else you'd like to, um, to ask.